Welcome to eCancer, our August edition of uh, what's hot and what's uh, new and what's worth reading and watching. I'm Gordon McVeigh, I'm the founding editor, and I'm responsible for the failure to produce a July issue of uh, eCancer Catch Up. Uh, that's because, and you'll have noticed a change of my voice perhaps, uh, I uh, had a radical prostatectomy uh, done uh, by Professor Bernardo Rocco in Milan and uh, it was driven, I'm told, by a robot. Lengthy operation and that's where my voice went. It has stirred, I have to say, a big grudge uh, about urologists failing to do randomised clinical trials in prostate cancer management. There are so many options now in surgery for prostate cancer management, so many options in radiation therapy, and now we've got HIFU on the block, high intensity focused ultrasound, claiming a little bit of the action. We've got lots more imaging now with really good MRI, I know from experience a month ago, and also we've now got very sophisticated uh, PET scanning with the PSA membrane antigen. Again, uh, totally painless experience. I can't find anything saying that da Vinci is better than, um, than radical prostatectomy, the old style, in a randomised uh, trial fashion. But I can tell you that the bulk of the non-randomised evidence points to a faster recovery uh, from the patients who have been uh, operated on by a robot. And I can vouch for that because I'm just four and a half weeks or thereabouts uh, further on. And also a lot less uh, blood loss. My blood loss in day one was 40 millilitres. The average for the old fashioned prostatectomy is around 800 mils. So obvious uh, qualitative things as a patient I can say with authority that I didn't ever have in June. And uh, I'd urge uh, the uh, neurology community out there to start looking at uh, better ways of assessing and then informing patients about the evidence base uh, for radiation versus surgery versus high food, whatever. Now on today's uh, uh, menu, we have a really interesting group of, uh, of uh, videos. Uh, we have been to MASK, a very good supportive care conference, and we've got good videos, uh, particularly covering infection and breakthrough uh, pain. And there's also a um, contribution from I Manage Cancer, which is a EU project where eCancer is the, uh, the main dissemination communication um, partner. And uh, we went to uh, the Best of Ask meeting in Miami, not because it's a nice place to go, but because there was a mixture in the audience of Spanish speakers and English speakers. And our videos reflect that exactly, uh, with Spanish videos and uh, some interviews in, in English. Certainly uh, worthwhile brushing up if you didn't get to ASCO and you didn't see our wonderful uh, calendar of super uh, videos taken just after that important meeting. Then we've got a two or three uh, really interesting uh, one-off uh, interviews, uh, one of which uh, our team would really like to uh, have you focus on is Dr. David Hunter at uh, Oxford University and he's talking about the importance of doing international collaborative epidemiology studies to unlock a few more of the secrets of why we get cancer and uh, where we get cancer, etc. So those are our videos for um, August. And then uh, we've got a number of uh, teaching modules which I'd like to uh, bring to the attention of the trainee surgeons. Uh, we've got uh, five cancer-specific um, modules. We've got four, mo four or five modules, I think, in each of the topics. We've got a breast cancer um, set. We've got a rectal set just about to appear this month and established our colon and pancreas cancer. We've also got general uh, videos on how to do things in uh, surgical training which are not specific to uh, cancer management and there are six or seven of those and well worth seeing. They're very useful for uh, developing uh, skills, looking at information, getting uh, caught up with what's best practice uh, any time of the day or night whenever it suits you, whenever you've got a waking time. Uh, these are, go alongside uh, assessment uh, as built into all of our teaching modules and also obviously um, you'll get a certificate at the end just to show that you've actually done the work. 
We have spoken before about the palliative care modules, uh, which originated in uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, 20 modules on how to do palliative care. And then uh, they've been refilmed in India uh, in English and in Hindi, and they've been refilmed in Latin America, in Spanish, and in Portuguese. We have uh, our first paper uh, from Swaziland on uh, the problems of palliative care in Swaziland. That was one of our uh, target countries in the very first palliative care modules. And it's good to see, first of all, a paper coming out of Swaziland on palliative care, extremely important, but also that they're highlighting all the issues that uh, uh, we have um, um, put forward in our teaching modules, uh, big things around lack of training, lack of communication, lack of understanding about palliative care, uh, the shortage of uh, medicines, uh, good painkillers, and uh, shortage of access to radiation therapy. The most arresting uh, paper uh, to be published this month is uh, on suicide in uh, cancer patients. And it's a really vast uh, survey done by a team at uh, Cornell, uh, looking through 3.6 million uh, patients with cancer and finding 6,600 suicides. The suicide rate in cancer patients is double that of the American uh, population. Uh, the team who, uh, who did this really important study looked also at different kinds of cancer. They looked at the common cancer, they looked at lung, looked at uh, cancer of the breast, they looked at colorectal cancer, and they looked at prostate cancer, and they found that uh, patients with lung cancer double the survival incidence of the other three. There was also interest in how fast the whole tragedy occurred. In lung cancer patients, uh, suicides occurred within six or seven months of the diagnosis. For patients who had uh, prostate cancer, it was uh, four or five years before suicide and presumably um, onset of metastasis. I don't know the explanation, but it's a lot longer than uh, patients with lung cancer committed suicide. Also, patients with colorectal cancer and uh, breast cancer, two or three years, more than that sometimes, uh, before suicide was contemplated and then uh, carried out. I haven't seen this sort of uh, uh, paper before, looking in such detail uh, at uh, an awful side effect of the diagnosis of cancer, and I would uh, commend it to you. Obviously, it begs the question, why are uh, we not finding people who are at risk of, uh, of such severe depression, anxiety, that they may be at risk of committing suicide? And what do we do about it when we find them? These are questions that we need to look at a little bit more seriously given this important paper. Now two papers, one from Milan and uh, one from Okayama University in Japan, talking about cancer mimicking and camouflaging a non-cancerous condition. The paper from Japan talks about uh, white globe appearance in the stomach. This is uh, endoscopists' uh, uh, territory and they know all about the appearance of uh, white globules on the surface of the stomach, uh, camouflaging gastric cancer. And here we've got a report of two patients, uh, Japanese uh, uh, patients over the age of 70, who are on multiple medicines, I assume having something to do with the white global furry stuff that was covering the stomach. And in neither of those patients was gastric cancer uh, present. So you can get this white furry lining, which is really quite uh, um, difficult to diagnose. The, the histology is, of course, completely nonspecific, uh, but it's usually been written up as a sign of gastric cancer. That need not be the case. And then a case report from um, Milan, from the gynecology and radiology group, where a patient was diagnosed as having par peritoneal carcinosis, and it turned out to be non-malignant. It was not ovarian cancer, it was not gastric cancer with a classic peritoneal spread. No, this was a patient with a non-tuberculosis mycobacterial infection of the peritoneum, uh, which uh, cleared up. So, interesting, it brought back to me uh, a, a, a diagnostic issue in Amsterdam when I first uh, went there as a consultant and I saw a patient who was being labelled uh, on a basis of a chest x-ray as having multiple metastases in the lungs. Uh, having come from Glasgow, an underdeveloped uh, backward uh, part of the world, 
Um, I spotted this as miliary tuberculosis. None of my consultant colleagues in the National Cancer Institute in Amsterdam had ever seen miliary tuberculosis before. It turned out that it was indeed miliary tuberculosis and the patient uh, did not have lung metastasis and did not go on to die of those lung metastasis. So always be on the lookout uh, for other illnesses, uh, camouflaging as cancer and vice versa. Regular readers of eCancer uh, will know, of course, that we run uh, superb meetings in Spanish in Latin America, two or three a year, and they are a massive success. They're attended usually by four or five hundred oncologists, and uh, they, they are phenomenally good. Uh, just to say that in two or three months to come, we are running the palliative care meeting in Argentina, which I've mentioned before, Buenos Aires, and then an all uh, oncology topics meeting in Chile. And if you're in any of those countries or nearby, I'd uh, commend them to you. All the data and all the dates, etc., are on eCancer. That's all for uh, this month's uh, uh, update. And uh, just a personal note of thanks to uh, family and friends and the team at uh, eCancer for all their support uh, during my last month when I've been uh, grappling uh, with uh, my prostate. Thanks. Speak to you next month. Thank <laughs> you.